I'm very glad to be with all the rest of the outcasts here tonight. The theme of my remarks was really set by Oscar Wright last night when he referred to himself as an outcast. And he and I and a good many of us in this room are outcasts in more than one sense. We are both, he and I, members of a persecuted ethnic group. I of a Jewish group that has been persecuted throughout the ages. He of a black group that has been persecuted throughout the ages. But we are outcasts in an even more fundamental way because we are outcasts within our own ethnic group. As you know, for a very long time, the Jews, than whom no people have benefited so much from the free market, have been among the foremost opponents of a free market. And in that respect, I have been an outcast within the ethnic group because I disagree with the idea that the way the Jews or any other persecuted group can benefit themselves or improve their conditions is by relying on the goodwill of the majority that is prejudiced against them. Oscar is similarly a minority within or an outcast within his ethnic group because he too believes that the way in which the blacks can improve their conditions is by fending for themselves, becoming responsible individually, and not by relying on the great white father in Washington, or for that matter, in Sacramento. It's interesting to note that with respect both to my, per my persecuted minority and his, they have never achieved anything fundamentally improving their lot by virtue of the intervention of the government. They have achieved what they have achieved despite governmental efforts rather than the other way. They have achieved it by relying on voluntary exchange and they have profited most in those societies and in those areas of the society where there was a greatest degree of freedom for individuals to pursue their own objectives without let or hindrance. We have had a great deal of talk here, and a good talk, an excellent talk, much of it, about the problem of poverty, of high black, age un black teenage unemployment, about the underclass in the black community. It's a major and a very real and deep problem, but I ask you to consider for a moment the basic sources of that poverty and what's responsible for it. Number one, bad schooling. Who provides the schooling? Utterly disgraceful that you should have such low quality schooling in areas which serve or are supposed to serve the underclass and the poor in the community, whether they be black or whether they be uh, Hispano Americans or what? Mexican Americans or what? That you have bad schooling? Why? because it's run by the government. Is there any area in your existence in which the blacks get as raw a deal as they do in schooling? A black who has enough money can buy the same kind of house almost anywhere. He's discriminated against, of course, but he can buy a house which is much better, relatively speaking, to what a white can buy than the kind of schooling he can get. He can buy the same automobile. He can shop at the same stores. But even if he has the money, it's extremely difficult for him to get the same quality of schooling. In order to do that, he has to have enough money to be able to move where he, doesn't prob where he probably doesn't want to move. I keep asking black leaders around this country whenever I meet them, where do you send your children to school? They send them to private schools. They don't send them to government schools. So you have bad schooling because it's provided by the government and because the poor people of this country have no other alternative. Those of us who are in the upper or middle classes, we can afford to pay twice for schooling, once in taxes and once by paying tuition, but the poor fellows in the ghettos and the slums of this country cannot afford to pay twice for schooling, and that's why they have bad schooling. If you go from schooling, what's the next major source 
of the so-called underclass. Government, welfare, and public assistance programs. Programs which are erected in the name of helping the poor, but which have the effect that once anybody is so unfortunate as to have to depend on those programs, it's very difficult for him to get out of that situation. So instead of this being a temporary problem, it tends to become a permanent one. Now, obviously, that's not true of all of them by any manner of means. And I'm not saying that's a black problem. It's a problem of poor people, whether they're black or white or any other color. And many of them do surmount that. But for many, you have established a culture of poverty because it's so difficult to get out from under. What is the next major source of poverty? <coughs> housing. Why do you have bad, such bad housing? You have it in the first place because the federal government subsidized people to move out in the <coughs> suburbs with the <laughs> veterans' housing loans, with the subsidized housing, with the, uh, with the FHA, with Fannie Mae, and all the rest. That was a program to subsidize owned homes, almost all in the suburbs, and to encourage people to move out of the central cities. And then you had an urban removal program, which Marty Anderson, who was here, wrote the definitive work on, The Federal Bulldozer, which, is a, which quite properly has become called a Negro removal program. You have a fourth source of poverty, which is the one that uh, Walter Williams talked about earlier. In the first place, government schools turn out youngsters who are not educated and who don't have any skills. And then to add insult to injury, we say to employers, you must discriminate against those people. You cannot hire them unless you are willing to give them charity. Because if they're, not, if they're, if they're so poorly educated and trained and skilled that they're not worth in the market, the product they produce is not worth $3.10 an hour, you may hire them provided you make up the difference out of your pocket. And so the minimum wage laws, the trade union restrictions, the kind of taxi cab restrictions, every single one of these major sources of poverty is produced by government. Now what's the way out of it? And that's where I think I have the greatest difference with many of the statements that were made today on this, uh, in this program. If you think that there's a way out of this, by getting government to pass laws especially to benefit the blacks, you're kidding yourself. That isn't going to happen. I want to read to you something which I wrote close to 20 years ago, which was published about 18 years ago in a book called Capitalism and Freedom, in which I was discussing the relation between capitalism and discrimination. And I wrote, and I quote, FEPC legislation, Fair Employment Practices Commission legislation, involves the acceptance of a principle that proponents would find abhorrent in almost every other application. If it is appropriate for the state to say that individuals may not discriminate in employment because of color or race or religion, then it is equally appropriate for the state, provided a majority can be found to vote that way, to say that individuals must discriminate in employment on the basis of color, race, or religion. Now, you will all recognize that that is exactly what has happened in the interim as you have moved from the idea of non-discrimination to the idea of affirmative action. Temporarily, that affirmative action may benefit some blacks, some low-income people. But if you believe that Supreme Court decisions are going to be able to stop a majority of the population which is prejudiced, from, an active, from using this power to benefit themselves rather than the people who are disadvantaged, you're kidding yourself. That's not the way out. What is the way out? I think the way out is a very different one from the part of all of those who, us who are interested in, in the people who are disadvantaged in our society. There are black problems, problems that are peculiar to the black community, just as there are Jewish problems that are peculiar to the Jewish community. Baptist problems that are peculiar to the Baptist community. But those problems are problems that should be worked on by these communities 
among their own people by themselves through voluntary activities. And I think the only way we can make progress is by recognizing that from the point of view of political tactics, there are o the only problems we have to deal with are human problems. I come to a point, one of the most important comments that were made all day was made by Professor Osborne when he said, how do we make it politically profitable to change the rules of the game? How do we make it politically profitable for those people who are in power to alter arrangements? Now, we do not make it politically profitable for them by asking a majority of the people to vote burdens on themselves to benefit a minority. You may for a time get away with it, but you won't get away with it for long. You make it politically profitable by using your energies to promote programs to solve human problems, which affect everybody, so that you can organize a coalition for programs that are not to benefit the blacks, not to benefit the Puerto Ricans, not to benefit any special group, but to benefit a wide class of people. Let me illustrate with the case of schooling. I do not think you're going to get anywhere in promoting schooling by much as I sympathize with the objections, objectives of Oscar uh, Wright, I don't think you're going to get anywhere by promoting uh, community independence, separation. As I told Oscar Wright, if he goes that way, he's going to end up being a front man for interests he doesn't want to front for. Unless the separate community is going to provide its own financing along the lines that Bob Hawkins talked about this afternoon, if it's going to believe it's going to be politically independent when somebody else is paying the purse, it's got another thing coming. There's not, that's not the way to solve it. On the other hand, if you go the way of vouchers, it's not merely that that's complete decentralization, that that goes to parents. But then you're talking about something. That you've got a group of Catholics here that are very much interested in that. You've got a group of Jews here who are very much interested in their schools. You've got a all the parents of the country, go around this country. Uh, Oscar and others have talked about the great op opposition to compulsory busing. There's just as wide a consensus that public schooling is not producing what parents expect of it. And so a voucher scheme is not a black scheme. It's not a Catholic scheme. It's a scheme to solve a human problem and to provide everybody around the country, every parent, around the country with an opportunity to have greater control over the kind of schools his children go to. And that's the way it seems to me we can make it politically profitable, by having measures that have the property that you can get a coalition in back of. The same thing is true in case after case. The great virtue of moving to eliminate barriers, of trying to get rid of things like the minimum wage, like restrictions on on taxi cabs and so on, is that you can generalize them, that you can make them into a general principle, that you can get people to adopt and to follow and to pursue because they appeal to a much wider range of interests, because they're a satisfactory fundamental principle. And I believe it's only by making, by moving in that direction, that you can possibly achieve the kind of objectives that all of us want to achieve. If you look, and uh, here are the stuff that Tom has done outside of schooling is fascinating. If you look at the ethnic groups in this country that have succeeded and have done well, you name me one of them that has had that success as a result of special attention by government. The Jews certainly did not succeed because they were getting special government privilege. The Japanese did not succeed on that ground. The Chinese did not succeed on that ground. They succeeded by taking advantages of the opportunities that the private market offered to them. And I think this is a subject that has very widespread interest. You will not get great support on the part of the community if you ask 80% of the, 86% of the people to tax themselves more heavily to help the other 14%. But if you say to 100% of the people, we want lower taxes, we want a freer society, we want a smaller government, we want to get government off our back, then you've got a lot of allies. And it seems to me that that's the only effective way in work which we can work to achieve our objectives. Now, I come back to my initial theme. 
I have been an outcast for a very long time and in many different groups. And one of the things that has been fascinating to me in my experience is the strength and power of ideas as opposed to numbers. Numbers have never accounted for anything. Ideas, good ideas, right ideas really count for something. And I have seen an area, and in numbers of different areas, the outcasts become the majority. And they become the majority because they are the ones who have what's needed to solve the problems. And the outcasts who are in this room, I think, will be destined to become the majority, not because you get payoffs in the political scene, not because by voting for the right party you get a job that you couldn't otherwise get. See, I come back to what Tony here said this afternoon, a quid pro quo on an individual basis. But if you think that you're going to improve the lot of the, four, uh, of the minority of Americans who are black by quid pro quos on a political basis, I don't care whether it's Democrats or Republicans. You're kidding yourself. The other 86% will have more quids. You don't have enough quids for that. <laughs> but you can become a majority or be with the majority if you take advantage of the new ideas, of the ideas that are bubbling up in this group, the kinds of ideas that you've been talking about today, and recognize the extent to which they are appropriate for human problems that reach beyond the black community, and in that case, the outcast will become the majority. Thank you. Uh, Milton Friedman's personal interest in this activity has been truly uh, uh, encouraging. And thank you, Milton. When it was called to our attention this afternoon by one of the panels that Percy Sutton owned one of the largest or owned the largest commercial radio station in New York, it caught my attention. In my youth, Percy, I bought a radio station at just about the time television was making this. <laughs> Now, Percy, I immediately decided that any man who could establish the leading commercial radio station in New York City couldn't be all bad. <laughs> now, it's been also called to my attention that Mr. Sutton has a variety of business interests, and we're delighted to have his point of view here tonight. We call your attention, Mr. Sutton, to the fact that you are representing the East Coast on the podium at this time. Mr. Sutton. <laughs> Mr. President Monroe Brown, thank you very much. You know, it is a thing of importance for me to be here tonight. I don't feel as secure at this moment as I felt earlier this morning. I'd been here last night. I'd been invited to come here by some friends, and I'm thankful that I was invited. This morning, however, I felt good, Hosea Williams. I was going to be a star. It's going to be a star. As a matter of fact, when someone asked me this morning, Tom Sowell, how things were going, I must tell you, I wasn't overly impressed after last night. Uh, I'm glad you came back. I'm glad all of you came back uh, today, because after last night's performance, someone asked me how things went. And I have a way, out of the years I was in the political arena, of not wishing to offend. I come from New York and we have many, we're an ethnic city and you can't survive by, if you offend anyone. So I've learned not to offend people. And a term that I use when I uh, don't want to make comment on a thing is say, it's interesting. <laughs> so my comment last night was, this morning rather, was that it was interesting. I must tell you though, 
Another thing I was anxious to come, I've known Hank Lucas, and Hank Lucas brought me to your attention and to uh, Laurie's attention. And, and I wanted to come out here. Now, don't be offended when I say this. I don't want to hurt anybody's feeling because I want to see what a black conservative looked like. <laughs> see, uh, this, I, I, now, I can understand Milton Friedman being a conservative. I can understand Monroe being a conservative. I can understand all the white conservatives in this room. But when I see Walter Williams standing up there talking this conservative talk, talking about deregulating and getting rid of the environmental problems that, you know, I'm very pleased when I hear this. <laughs> Because I know this, just, it was, it when they report on black folks 20 years ago, it was for us stealing chickens. <laughs> now, some people might have taken a certain pride that now black folks rob banks. <laughs> but you can't talk like they talk unless you've gotten something already. And they don't sound like they're saying, I've got mine, you get yours. Dan Smith sounds rational when he talks. Now, because I thought I was going to be a star this morning, and tonight I know I'm not going to be a star, and I'm just bubbling over with things I want to say, I'm, I feel much like, much like the man who was the railroad, and none of you, Ed Meese isn't old enough, none of you in this room, I think, except Tom Berkeley, who is my business partner, as old as I am, is old enough to remember that black folks never got to, before the old coal-fired steam engine went out, black folks never got to be engineers. And there was a thing called a roundhouse, Chuck Stanley, where they used to take the train to turn it around. They took Sam out this day. My father's name was Sam, so it's all right. Uh, uh, they, but, but, my father's name was Sam, but since we came from San Antonio, Texas, and since he was my junior high school principal, my high school principal, we never called him Sam. His name was Chase.